welcome Congresswoman uh, Pramila Jayapal. Uh, your timing is impeccable. Uh, we've just finished hearing from Anthony Hajar, who's given us an overview of the revolution last year and the transition government. And we welcome you here today. Let me give you a brief introduction. We have people from all over the world and a lot of people from around the United States. Congresswoman Jayapal represents Washington State and is one of the great progressive champions there. She's been a longtime leader highlighting the importance of human rights, democracy, and peace in Sudan. She currently is working to delist Sudan from the U.S. government designation of Sudan as a state sponsor of terrorism and to increase U.S. diplomatic and economic support for the transition. Today is a special day for her and for us as she releases a book entitled Use the Power You Have, A Brown Woman's Guide to Politics and Political Change. In this book, she explains how we can achieve a truly inclusive America that works for all of us. We are grateful for you coming here today and uh, we're happy for you to speak now. And if you do have time to answer a question or two, we'd love for you to stay on for, uh, for longer if you could. Typically, we take uh, questions at the very end, but if you're of the, all the speakers, but if you can only take a question after you speak, we'd be delighted to have an opportunity to ask a few questions. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Michael, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. I have to go speak on the floor right after this, so I'm going to let Jessica figure out when I need to get off, and if I have time, I'll absolutely take questions. I want to thank you uh, for your kind introduction, but most of all, for everything that you have done to support the Sudanese people in their nonviolent struggle for democracy. And I, of course, appreciate your mentioning my book. I wanted to mention that Sudan is called out in there. There's a, a section on nonviolence in one of the chapters. And uh, I have given the Sudanese people um, just a mention there for the inspiration that you have provided on really utilizing nonviolent uh, tactics um, with love and generosity, but also dealing with the brutality of what the Sudanese people went through in order to liberate and achieve the first steps towards liberation. Um, it is an honor to be here in such esteemed company among friends and partners. And Anthony, I want to thank you because you graciously joined me in a briefing for members of Congress last year on the situation in Sudan. Um, I want to thank my friend, a longtime friend and co-conspirator, Mubarak El Amin, who has really advised me and opened my eyes to so much in Sudan from the very beginning. And I wanna thank Nonviolence International for organizing the webinar and also for educating people around the world uh, about how the international community can actually support the Sudanese people. Um, I have been an ardent supporter of uh, the people of Sudan and you know, of the, the way in which the protests were peacefully organized and adhered consistently to a nonviolent strategy of protest in order to achieve a democratic future um, in Sudan. And I've proudly used my platform and my voice in Congress to do everything I can to lend my support. I think as the first Indian American woman elected to the House of Representatives, as an immigrant myself, one of only 14, but most importantly, as an organizer and an activist who has been arrested and led my own forms of uh, nonviolent civil disobedience in order to achieve the goals of justice, I personally have been so inspired by the work of the people of Sudan. And it is really thanks to the advocacy of the Sudanese diaspora community here in the United States that Congress has taken several very important actions to support the peaceful transition to a civilian-led democratic government in Sudan. This included passing House Resolution 432 that was introduced by my colleague, Dan Kildee, that condemned the horrific attacks on peaceful protesters in the June 3rd massacre and called for an immediate transition uh, to democratic leadership in Sudan. I joined my colleagues in speaking on the House floor in support of the resolution, calling attention particularly to the Sudanese women who played an outsized role in holding strong in the face of violence, danger, and death, and calling for justice for those killed in the massacre. Um, I was very proud to take part in an official bipartisan congressional delegation visit 
to Sudan in, in January of this year. We just got that visit in before COVID hit and all of the international travel stopped. And I'm so glad that we did. It was the first ever after the revolution of um, members of Congress. And we were led by Chairwoman Karen Bass of the Africa Subcommittee, uh, as well as Representative Sensenbrenner, Barbara Lee, Dan Kildee, who are all longtime friends of Sudan. During our visit, um, I was educated every single day uh, about the challenges, about the opportunity, and about the work that still must happen and that the United States must be a part of making happen if this transition is to be successful. We spoke with so many brave women and young people who saw their friends and their family, peaceful protesters murdered uh, in the streets by security forces. And yet we were encouraged by the work of these very women who are fighting for equal representation now in the transitional government. I was particularly thrilled to meet with the women of Afad University and the professors and the students who played a significant role in the protests that led to Bashir's ouster. We also were able to meet with uh, local resistance communities who, who did play such an important role as well in opposing the Bashir government and organizing across the country. And incredibly moving to hear the stories of courage and resilience and the commitment to nonviolent resilient movements and the possibilities that they bring for lasting peace. We did meet with a number of the top governmental leaders during our trip, ministers of the transitional cabinet, and uh, heard about you know, the enormous work ahead and the challenges. And I think nobody's eyes are closed to how challenging this time really uh, will continue to be and how incredibly important it is for the United States to stay engaged. And so um, I think that we had uh, really unanimous, almost unanimous support on our delegation that we in Congress need to work with the administration to end Sudan's designation as a state sponsor of terrorism. Just last week, as you're well aware, the State Department released its 2019 country reports on terrorism, which commended the work of the Sudanese transitional government to cooperate with the United States on counterterrorism issues. And it's a promising sign, but while US and Sudanese negotiators work to address ongoing issues around Sudan's payment of claims relating to past terrorist bombings of US embassies, the fact is that the Sudanese people are struggling to survive. We don't have a lot of time here. Uh, you know, we know that because of the, of the um, pillage um, and pilfering of the wealth of the Sudanese people by the Bashir government, the reality is Sudan remains the 14th poorest country in the world and cannot access the international aid that is so vital to rebuilding the economy. And, you know, we're frankly facing the other issue, which is the, uh, the pandemic um, here in the United States and, and around the, the world. And Sudan is being excluded from critical World Bank relief for developing countries due to the US state sponsor of terrorism designation. That is just wrong. And we have to adapt US policy to the new reality in Sudan, a people powered revolution, a civilian led transition, transitional government and a fight for accountability for al-Bashir's crimes. In order for this democratic transition to work, I can tell you as a member of the United States Congress, I believe that the United States must stand with the people of Sudan. We must do everything in our power to help achieve peace, prosperity, and stability. And so I wanna thank you all for gathering virtually today to develop a plan forward for how the international community can help keep the Sudanese people during, uh, help the Sudanese people during this very difficult, challenging time. Um, and I just want to say as one organizer to many other organizers, please keep raising your voices. Please keep building sustained uh, movements for, for justice. Please keep exercising your power and educating others on the incredible potential 
that Sudan has and what we must do as global citizens to support the democratic aspirations of the Sudanese people. Um, so thank you so much uh, to you, Michael, and to everyone that is on the, uh, on the line today. I don't know if Jessica is communicating with you about whether or not I have time here for a question, but until she says I have to go, I'm happy to take one. <laughs> we'd love, to, we'd so love to grab a moment to have a the first question come from the Sudanese uh, community. And I think we have uh, Asma, Ismail Ahmed from Khartoum, who'd like to ask the first question. Thank you very much for um, these insights and hi everybody. Um, Congresswoman, thanks for your contribution and for your highlights and happy to hear that Sudan has an ally in the Congress. Um, my question is regarding the timeline. We all know that um, like the, the, after July, the, the, the Congress will break. Uh, after uh, for September. So I think in, in terms of timeline, and you mentioned time is uh, of an essence for Sudan, what are your expectations for the next move from the United States uh, with regard to uh, removing the designation of Sudan from the SST? Well, uh, it's an excellent question. And of course the challenge is that we are operating in the midst of a pandemic and we have very little time on the floor. Every vote, just imagine this takes um, uh, almost an hour because of how we do the votes. So for example, today we'll have votes for eight hours on uh, because we have a number of amendments. And so the floor time is limited. And so I think we have to pursue uh, multi-pronged strategies. I don't think anything will come to the floor um, before the end of July, but you never know. Um, so I think we are looking at later in the fall if it were to be congressional action. But I think that the other part of this can be the continuing negotiations with the administration directly because I think that that is really critical and I saw the report that was released as a good sign. I think we need some more movement and pressure which we can also do through letters and other things. So we will continue to look at all the ways in which we can move this forward. But again, I just wanna emphasize that members of Congress move when they hear from people in their districts. That is just a very important thing for you to know. And we have, you know, four pandemics before us right now in the United States. We have COVID-19, we have economic devastation where 44 million Americans have filed for unemployment, the highest level since the Great Depression. We have uh, police brutality and anti-blackness and white supremacy that is sweeping our country with protesters that give us inspiration because they are speaking for justice and they are demanding change that has, you know, here in our country that has uh, been allowed, you know, for systems that have been allowed to exist for too long. And then of course we have somebody in the White House that is doing everything he can to destroy the constitution. So um, I don't want to minimize uh, you know, the challenge of moving something forward that is not directly related to those things. And the international community has taken such a back seat, which should not be the case, but it is the case. Um, and so just want to both give you my, my words of commitment, but also be real that what we need is for the diaspora here in the United States to organize quickly to draw attention to what we need to do to contact your members of Congress and to build the kind of movement that can elevate this to the level that people really need given everything else that's going on. And I hope that doesn't come across as discouraging. I'm speaking as an organizer to other organizers where you, we just have to understand that this is the way things work here. Um, and I promise I'll do everything that I can to help. They are telling me that I need to go. And so I'm so sorry, but I have to go speak on the floor about green infrastructure and housing. So um, I wanna thank you again for everything that you're doing and, and how glorious it is to be in a community of nonviolent resistance justice seekers. Thank you so much and thank take you, care. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.